Welcome to HC Nation, your guide to the best in HD content and the best in home theater gear, no matter what your budget is, high, low, in between, we're there for you. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. We have a lot of great stuff coming up today's show, but I think we're both a little excited about Ooh. the new Steam OS. <laughs> yeah, Steam. baby. I like this. Linux-based gaming oh, for the part. world. I, I, it was funny, Veronica and I were, uh, uh, I can't remember if the word is arguing or having a thoughtful discussion on Texilla yesterday, um, but it's, it, we, we all love Steam. All of us love Steam. If you don't love Steam, you haven't tried Steam. It's from Valve. It's video games. They show up on your computer. It's the, can't say that word on this show. It's good. But we've been talking about, we've been waiting for since CES, like oh, a yeah. Steam box, right? A dedicated Steam appliance. And apparently the dedicated Steam appliance might actually require something called the Steam OS, which as you mentioned, is a Linux distro. Yeah. And that's where it starts losing me. Really? Because I love Linux. But Linux and gaming are not, they're, they're, they could be so awesome. It's all about reliability. Yes. Your game console, your typical game console is a bulletproof brick of hardware that has its own dedicated OS. Right. No virus problems, no, oh, user screwed something up. In this case, dealing with a, a relatively stable build that they've customized themselves in terms of the Steam OS, that gives them, that gives them abil the ability basically to offer, offer gaming on the PC side of things in a very, very good, solid, controlled environment. If they have the driver support for GPU performance, because that's yeah. been the classic problem, you know, Linus Torvalds, the founder of Linux, at one point just went off on, I want to say, NVIDIA. And like magically, six weeks later, NVIDIA released a long, desperately overdue driver update for Linux for their 3D accelerators. And magically, performance went up by like 50% on Linux platforms. I just, I, I'm excited, but I also want to see more Linux games in the sense of more of the games I want to play brought to Linux. I'll be curious to see how they also deal yeah. with things like DirectX and the titles that require certain certain drivers and systems in order to be present that normally aren't available on Linux. How is that going to fly? However, everyone I've talked to, if you've never tried Steam, uh, I had a friend of mine come over this weekend with his notebook and mm -hmm. beyond excited about the big picture mode that Steam currently offers, which is very similar to what you'll see when you load up Steam OS. Basically sits down on my couch, plugs in an HDMI cable, pulls out his game controller, and has an experience very similar to what console game is providing right now. And his experience basically led him to say to me straight up, it's like, look, I think I'm experiencing what would be considered next gen console gaming right now. Yeah. That's how good it can be. So I can't wait to see the actual OS ship free for everyone to try. That integrates not only the gaming experience, a, a managed environment for gaming as mm -hmm. well, including driver updates that, you know, hopefully they'll have yeah. that. That's built in currently. Maybe they'll Maybe they'll really have that working in time for Linux. In addition to also providing just a, a you know, something for the, the, maybe the console gamer to finally move over to PC gaming, PC gaming, and actually give it a well, shot. Is it PC gaming if it's a small selection of Linux-only titles versus the incredible selection of Windows I, titles? I want everything. Yeah, if, and if anybody can bring everything over to Steam on Linux, it'll be Valve. I will say, if you haven't checked it out, Big Picture on Steam is the bomb. It's essentially their way of making uh, Steam more friendly to your, your living room, your lean-back environment, your home theater environment. It is awesome if you have a home theater PC or if you can just get your gaming PC hooked up to your HD TV or projector check it out because there's something's truly awesome about having like a freaking hundred inch screen with gaming madness raining down on you I'm not saying like you know angry birds on the Roku 3 isn't bad <laughs> but a full gaming environment with full surround sound on a big screen is freaking awesome I also too it's just the experience of shopping for games on Steam as well that may be one of yeah. the most addictive things you will soon learn is that the Steam sales drag you right back in with uh, deals on some of your favorite titles that you might have missed the first time around too so yeah. there's a lot there a lot of gaming goodness to be had for a lot of people and that whole scene I just witnessed though of watching someone use a notebook with a with a standard game controller to play some of their favorite titles and just have their mind kind of blown or expanded into saying you know what the PC can be an amazing platform if it's properly managed and set up correctly for most folks. The, the PC is an amazing gaming platform. Um, I agree. Robert's a little console friendly these days. <laughs> Give me drivers. So Mr. Heron, if you didn't know, teamed up with Twit's home theater geek Scott Wilkinson to calibrate, well, Chief Twit himself, Leo Laporte, brought one of Samsung's sweet new curved OLED televisions and well, was it amazing? It was yes. it worth thousands of dollars? Not not you calibrating it. Not oh, that yeah. that wouldn't be worth thousands. No. But, but how was it? How was the TV? The TV itself, I think, was exceptional. We're talking about Samsung's new KN55 S9C, the S9C series of TVs. It's their first OLED TV available for public consumption. This curved screen features Samsung's timeless 
arena design, I really like that name, that surrounds that <laughs> uber thin curved screen with a stylish chrome trim frame. Now, the kind of the odd thing I realized right off the bat was that the S9C's frame is curved more than the OLED screen itself. So it looks a lot more curved at first glance than it really is. Now, huh. the screen curvature I didn't find to be a distraction at typical viewing distances and angles. Uh, it actually worked in some good advantages of being slightly off axis. So one of our kind of concerns when we started seeing the curved uh, OLEDs showing up was that there would be a sweet spot and viewing anywhere other than the sweet spot would suck. I, I would say it's not as much of a suck as you might think. It's actually that the, the less of the curve, it wasn't as curved as I thought, so the sweet spot is actually a little wider. A good, say a good three people on the couch. Okay. However, I did stand off to the far extremes of the TV and I did notice that, you know, white balance and color shifts were noticeable uh, at those wide angles only though. Screen reflections too were kind of interesting on a concave screen. Uh, any point light, let's say behind you or above you, anything that you could see on the screen being reflected, it actually stretched out the, the reflection. It wasn't just like you would have with a typical mirror where if you got a point light, oh, right. you got a point on the screen. This actually made everything wider. So even if you tried to look at yourself on the screen, it would appear to be a little stretched out. Also, the, the frame itself is actually forcing, the, it doesn't force the TV, it is. It leans back slightly. Really? So in addition to being a curved screen, it angles back a little bit it really requires the screen to be pay, placed low on wherever you're going to put it. Low, like below line of sight low? I or? would definitely have it really? below line of sight. Uh, in this case, we were looking at it mounted about eye height straight ahead, and it was a little odd in the sense that, well, it's, huh. it's up too high because it's angled back a little bit. Why? I think it's just, it's very similar to what Sony did last year with some of their, their premium design TVs. Make them floor friendly? It, it's made to be like on a coffee table level, and okay. it, it looks perfect when it's at that level, but Things like wall mounting or putting mm -hmm. it up high, nah, not so much. Interesting. Uh, Spec-wise, it's a 1080p screen, not 4K. It has a built-in video camera as well, which is kind of nice for you know doing your Skype or whatever. It also incorporates gesture and facial recognition as mm -hmm. well that we really didn't get into that much. But it's there if you want to experiment with it. It uses an external input box as well. Because the TV's so thin and the frame, there's not much to it really. Uh, there's there's no room to put the inputs. Things like the four HDMI ports, the two USB ports are actually built into this breakout box. Mm -hmm. I like breakout boxes personally. It gets the main set of connections away from the TV so that you can run a single cable to the display. I like that. I hate having a, a, a rat's nest of wires going into the sure. HDMI ports trying to use that. Uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are built in. Also, uh, my favorite feature of all had to be multi-view. Uh, with all of Samsung's, uh, this LED, uh, OLED and upcoming OLEDs, it'll feature a multi-view system that enables basically dual view. Two people, each with a cool pair of glasses, uh, that using the 3D glasses, can experience a separate sound and audio, uh, video experience while watching the TV. Now this could be somebody watching the main tuner on the TV and somebody watching one of the HDMI ports or some combination thereof. Uh, the glasses are actually special in that they incorporate built-in mm -hmm. headphones that are built into them so that oh, each wow. person also receives uh, a dedicated audio channel. I think this is good technology in the sense that I'm kind of burned out on all things 3D, although this is one of the better 3D TVs I've looked at lately. But this is another way to use that 3D technology in order to provide <laughs> more functionality, a useful functionality as well. Now, benchmark results, pretty damn good. Uh, SpectraCal's Calman test results came in, and the S9C's two and 10 point white balance controls were effective to say the least. Mm -hmm. And they enabled us to really smooth out the grayscale response in terms of making uh, the lightest shades and the darkest shades of gray all linear and nicely flattened out. Not too blue, not too green. And it was really great that way. As far as gaming mode goes, probably not the best TV I've seen for this particular <laughs> category of functionality. Anyway, 160.1 milliseconds when we had it off. Ow. When we turned on game uh, game mode, it actually dropped to about half, about 83.1. That's one. still like that's like Skype level lag. It's it's getting up there. It's an, it's enough to where it will probably interfere with with very time sensitive games. Be so it this your, is more of a cinema television sporting event. Without a doubt. Watching At least with you and two of your closest friends. Watching video is just, it's, a, it's admirable for a few reasons. Mm -hmm. the, uh, Samsung's S9C's uh, epic contrast was really where it, what blew me away the most. It, it, if you're sitting in a darkened environment, uh, you could really hardly dis uh, distinguish between the, the black borders of say a letterbox movie and the, the background or even the TV itself. It, it is inky dark. And uh, for darkroom viewing, actually, we ended up having to turn what they called the cell light, uh, very similar to what you'd have in a plasma display. We had to turn that way down, though, uh, in order to produce an eye-friendly picture. <laughs> this TV had plenty of brightness to be able to pump it out, uh, to produce a bright image in a bright room. 
And at first I was unconvinced that curved screens would appeal to me for a home theater environment, but the S9C did impress me. And the only thing I would say next was, where is LG's 55 inch curved OLED? <laughs> That's really what I wanna see next and have them, I doubt I'll be able to get them side by side, but at least I'll be able to see each one separately. So small group centered on the screen, three people wide max, and this is not a gaming system, this is a watching, you know, TV or movies sports for sure. Movies. And as far as the viewing angles go, yeah, three people probably for the absolute sweet spot, but you could have a pretty large room full of people off to the size, right. especially in a well-lit environment where the TV's pumping out a lot of light. It's going to be just fine. I, I, was, I was surprised at how I quickly stopped noticing how curved the screen, the screen was mm -hmm. and how accessible it really was at a pretty wide variety of angles. However, if you are standing off to the side and if you've got a critical view of some content you're familiar with, you may see some shifting in either the grayscale or the color a little bit. But overall, a solid performer. And we also tested it too, looking at things like expanded color gamuts as well. Mm -hmm. The standard for HD is a fairly restricted color gamut. There are some upcoming standards available on uh, new formats that we're looking at, like H.265, and some new standards related to television broadcast standards that are gonna expand the color palette. This TV has the capability of displaying a very large color gamut, but in addition, it also calibrated really nicely to show you exactly what needed to be shown for reference quality viewing. Did you and Scott have any big arguments or did you just stay to the spec and tune the machine? I, you know, if there was one thing about having two calibrators in the house, it, it was like chefs arguing over the recipe or something <laughs> like that. It's like, what do you want to do next? Oh, what do you want to do? Let's look at this content. No, let's look at this. Ah, we were there for a good, I want to say five hours. Wow. And I didn't, we didn't leave the house until midnight. I didn't get home till one. I didn't get to bed till three. I'm beat. <laughs> I was beat that weekend, that's for sure. But it was totally worth it. And I, this is really a next-gen technology as far as displays go, and I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to see it just become more widespread and more available at better pricing for the rest of us. Yeah, and we want to take a moment to thank Leo for giving us access to his new Samsung, because Samsung wasn't going to send this one, not just yet, and to Scott for sharing the uh, tuning with Mr. Heron. If you haven't seen it, by the way, Home Theater Geeks is the show on the Twit Network, twit.tv slash show slash home theater geeks. Scott's the man. Bam, and look. There you are. Hey now. Hey. We were there. <laughs> Shiny, happy, and that's gotta be one unbelievably well set up screen. I wanna, I wanna do it again. Without Scott there. You can come to my house and do it. <laughs> it's time to pull cable in my house and get the speakers set up. Uh, Scott and I were tag teaming that TV. That was, awesome. that was some good stuff. And I just wish I had more time to spend with things like the multi-view setup and some of the internal TV settings too that we just didn't have time to really dig into. We also didn't get into a lot of the video processing as well. We mostly focused on just specifically image quality and getting it out as best as possible. There it is. Best One in stuff. stock. Really? Only $8,997.99. Nine grand. Yeah. Gorgeous. Two new from $8,997.99. One refurbished. Nah. Nah. Not the refurb. <laughs> Unless it's like half. Oh my goodness. Blu-ray picks. Good week for Blu-rays. And our picks from the Blu-rays released on September 24th, 2013. Definitely Iron Man 3. And let me pull this up. Blu-ray.com did a great review. Uh, flat out, the best in the series since the Avengers. Uh, excuse me, I mean the original Iron Man. Tony Stark, run through the ringer post-alien invasion, courtesy of a script by co-director Shane Black, who you might know from Lethal Weapon, The Last Boy Scout, The Long Kiss Goodnight, and the awesome but totally underrated 2006 film Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, which features Downey Val Kilmer and Michelle Monaghan. It's a fun, if you're into noir and crime and mayhem and Downey being Downey, this is a really good flick, a really good role for Kilmer too. So anyhow, we were talking about Iron Man 3, Better script, epic video, Blu-ray.com loves the 1080p ABC transfer. Quote, primary surge and relents perfectly at black and toll's whim. Skin tones are nothing short of lifelike. Shadows are satisfying and natural. A delineation is revealing. Detail, meanwhile, is a sight to behold in and of itself. I like detail in Iron Man flicks. This sounds gorgeous. The soundtrack is epic. And skip the 3D version. Iron Man 3 is awesome in 2D, but this is no Avadar. Avadar? Avadar. Avadar. Said it. The blue, the aliens, the mayhem, the death, the awesome. big moral lesson. Avatar. Avatar. And, hey, seeing as Halloween's around the corner, who can say no to a 35th anniversary edition of Halloween just in time for <laughs> Halloween? Oh, no way. <laughs> Blu-ray.com gives the Anchor Bay re-release of the classic slasher flick a 4.5 out of 5 for video and audio. New transfer, finally, overseen by director of photography Dean Cundy. And there's an all-new Dolby True HD 7.1 loss of soundtrack. If you've never seen it, it's time. And you will be amazed by how many movies and TV shows have shamelessly ripped off this film. Like it or not, the 78 classic, 
Well, and look, I'm going to say it. it's a classic. It's gone beyond cult status. It is a touchstone of modern pop culture, not just of scary movies. And the new soundtrack is probably going to be utterly horrifying because with, with like having seen it in a mono screen in a freaking bowling alley theater on an army base a thousand years ago, scared that stuff out of me. So this is going to be amazing. Apparently, it has never looked this good in any home theater ever. Nice. 20 bucks. 20 bucks now. I'm going to have to add that to the collection. I take it home, scare the kids. It. So, I do, I do, I do. View 52 writes, after brightness and contrast are set, where should the backlight setting be, and how does it relate to both? That is a great question. Yeah. Uh, with brightness and contrast properly set, the backlight control on an LCD is a true brightness control that you yeah. should feel free to adjust to whatever level is comfortable for your eyes. Now, unlike the brightness control that adjusts the picture's black level, that's the cutoff point for dark detail, and the contrast control that influences peak bright detail the backlight control is a fancy dimmer switch for the backlight unit on your LCD TV. Now, keep in mind that lowering the LCD's backlight control too far can increase flicker, but adjusting the setting should have no effect on the brightness and contrast picture controls that you've already just set. So, so. brightness adjusts the blacks, contrast the adjusts level, the contrast, really. and then yeah. the screen brightness is basically how much light is blasting through totally. your brightness and contrast settings. That's that's it exactly. Yeah. And the beauty of LCDs really is that backlight control in the sense that right. it is that true brightness control. You, you feel free to mess with that all you want. Also, maybe you want to enable something like your, uh, your auto adjustment that would happen with using a room light sensor on the TV as well, but that's, uh, we'll get into that uh, yeah, if, another time. <laughs> if, there's one, if you tend to watch late at night and in a dark room, turn on the light sensor on the television because your eyes will hurt much less the next day. If you're, well, you laugh, right? If it's bright enough to use in a bright room with a lot of windows that are open to the sunshine, it is going to abuse your retinas at two in the morning when everything's dark. So yeah. turn the brightness down at night. I to see the best detail, you need to let your eyes dark adjust just a little yeah. bit. And that means not having a, sh a flashlight shining in your face. <laughs> and if the TV's cranked up too bright, that's exactly what'll happen in a dark viewing environment. Yeah. So keep that in mind. At Leet94 Mister, AKA 133794M3R tweets at HD Nation, <laughs> what's your opinion on natural preset as a starting point for calibration? I use it to prevent headaches at night. So I... it's kind of funny. There's like, there's natural, we've seen sports, we've seen games, we've seen, um, uh, cinema mode. Totally. What else have we seen for preset modes? Uh, dynamic, vivid are the, oh, two, yeah. the two big worst ones. Uh, now, natural, that picture preset, that's what it is. It sounds like a good starting point for easily improving image quality, especially compared to something like dynamic or a vivid mode, which mm -hmm. is just blasting light at the expense of detail. Also, some TVs have a natural preset in addition to something called cinema or movie, Try them all. Make sure that you know natural is the way to go for you and your viewing environment. Now with LCD televisions, changing the picture preset like you just did is usually faster than digging into the picture settings menu and manually adjusting things like the LCD's backlight level. Also, experiment with enabling your TV's room light sensor. Hey, we were just talking about that. Properly <laughs> configured, that room light sensor can reduce brightness in a dimly lit viewing environment while cranking up the lumens when the sun's shining. Although, I find that for calibration though, you probably don't want to have the room light sensor affecting the setup, so keep it disabled at least until you're done doing the other calibration work. There you have it. Yeah. It's kind of funny, and, and will it stay consistent if you change, is it still you know, the cinema mode if you changed all the other background settings on it? It depends on the TV. Some TVs in the, in the setup menu will mm -hmm. say, oh, once you've done all these adjustments to this input, would you like to apply that to all the other inputs? Mm -hmm. But the presets should remain static or independent of each other. So okay. you could configure, say, your natural preset for your darkest room viewing. Mm -hmm. And then if there's a standard or a normal mode, right. whatever that might be, you could leave that optimized for the brightest setting. And then just simply use those two presets to make it ideal for day or nighttime viewing. A lot of TVs now are incorporating actual day and night presets, right. which is really kind of the way to go. And now if you could also time that into, I don't know, a room light sensor or a clock to automatically automate that feature, that would be even better, but that's usually not the case. There is often a single button on the remote though for picture presets. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good to find that one button, that way you don't have to dive into too many layers of menus in, in TVs in order to make a simple change like that. But once they're set up, they should work, and most TVs will apply that same picture preset. So if you adjust the picture preset with HDMI 1, chances are that's gonna be the same setup for HDMI 2 if you switch over and use that same picture preset. Always worth checking. Yeah, double Win check. <laughs> Winfred writes in, I'm in the market for a 65 inch LED LCD, but it seems more and more have opted for the 120 hertz versus 240 hertz. Does 240 hertz still matter, or will a 120 hertz with 240 clear motion, that's Samsung's terminology, reproduce that smooth image that a real 240 hertz HDTV has? 
I'll just say that short answer is really no. There is no difference between 120 and 240 hertz. But 240 is twice as much as 120. It may cost more. <laughs> and I will say that usually the 3D TVs, LCDs in particular, they are 240 hertz sets nowadays compared to 120 for the other ones. And Samsung's use of clear motion rating is their way of comparing the motion performance of their LCD televisions to each other. And you could, you could kind of extrapolate that to other brands as well. Now, I do prefer the 120, 240 hertz LCDs compared to that classic 60 hertz model uh, because they can be configured to do a clean frame repeat of 24 frames per second video like Blu-ray movies. Now, fa frame repeat on most LCDs is not enabled by default. Frame interpolation is the norm where it creates that smoothing effect that looks like a camcorder. Everything was shot on right. a camcorder. I don't like it. <laughs> Frame, uh, frame interpolation, bad. Yeah. Frame repeat, okay. Yeah, except for video content and like sporting events and right. things like that. Then you can crank up the, inter the, the frame interpolation all you want. It, it really doesn't affect it that much. And it can actually improve the crispness of the picture. Turning off that frame interpolation, mm -hmm. likewise, can make some content lo look less crisp. But again, your movies are going to look like they were shot on a camcorder. So yeah. be aware that th that's the trade-off of leaving that technology enabled or disabled. And... To be perfectly honest with you, the only time I've really seen true differences in real world content is, well, we had to put in a test pattern to look at a motion resolution pattern and then turn the interpolation on and off to actually see the differences. They're not as noticeable in actual video sources. So keep that in mind. Don't get, don't get too crazy about it. If you like the look of one way over the other, go for it. Also, with interpolation enabled, you can, if you measure it, you usually get a slightly brighter picture, but you can always manipulate that with the backlight controller or other controls. It's, it's, it's not the be all end all. So I would rather just turn it off. 120 personally. hertz is okay then. Uh, it's fine. And that usually, <laughs> also too, if you look, it's probably not a 3D TV either right. if it's 120 hertz. Whereas the TVs that are running 240 or higher are typically the 3D models. Also, th that performance increase will translate into extra cost as well. So you probably got a better deal than compared to the 240 hertz model anyway, or ho hopefully a bigger screen. That's really what I. What one, I want. One more before we go. We got a tweet looking for help picking a cable card DVR at Carlos28355 tweets at Robert Heron at HD Nation. Only have over the air. Which is better, CTON or HD Home Run for a network DVR to a home theater PC? Hmm. hmm. Well, I've only used the HD Home Run Dual uh, for over the air recording or, or reception. Uh, and I'm pretty sure Seton only does cable card technology as of right now anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, now the HD Home Run Dual is my go-to over the air tuner. I love it. It's a great network enabled device that I can connect anywhere and anywhere in my home network and be able to access those dual tuners for over the air recording. I actually keep it in a room where the antenna is mm -hmm. and then run it through a, a power line ethernet to my Home, uh, to my network and mm -hmm. basically I can then place that antenna just about anywhere in the house where I get the best reception and then I'm able to tune all those channels with a dual tun tuner system and now Seton actually with their InfiniTV ETH is a six tuner cable card adapter that's similar basically to what Home Run does except it's you know for cable instead of over the air now this is also similar to the regular InfiniTV 6 PCIe adapter that we showed off a couple of weeks ago uh, I'm using that currently and I absolutely love it uh, that happens to be the network-enabled version of it, though. So if you'd rather have that on a network to m enable easier sharing, or if it's just the way you'd prefer to connect it into your home theater environment, mm -hmm. that's the way to go. It's nice that we have these options, though. Either, either I could put it directly into the, the home theater box, I can connect it with a USB connector if I need to, or I can do a network-based tuner and then access that with any system in the house. There's lots of good options there. It's all good. <laughs> it is. That's it for this episode of HD Nation. Please subscribe, revision3.com slash HD Nation. It's a place to find it. And email us, hdnation at revision3.com. That's right. And please email us your comments, questions, or suggestions, or post them right down below. And until next time, thanks for watching.